Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna to be talking all about pollinators in your garden, how to encourage them into your garden, um, different things that you can plant in different areas and how to keep them in your garden, all of that. Um, so this is probably one of my favorite topics. I absolutely love growing food, but I love to grow flowers as well and encourage the beneficials. They're so much fun to watch and they help your food too as you're growing. So they are super beneficial to have in your garden and I absolutely love it. So this is probably a really fun topic and I hope that you all enjoy it as well. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. I'm really excited to see a few people already active in the chat. Hi, Patty, hi, Linda. I would love to see from you all where you guys are located in. I am here in Oklahoma. I am in central Oklahoma in zone seven. So I, uh, it is quite hot out here. I uh, was out in the garden a little bit earlier and ooh, I already started sweating. We were gonna try and do this, this webinar outside, but we decided against it because it's just so hot out there. I was like, I don't know if I can handle that. So um, at least I'm in here now in the air conditioning and I'll go back out later on. So welcome everybody. I'm really happy to have you all here. I see we have some people from Sacramento, California. I hope the weather is better there. I bet it's beautiful there. And then, oh, New Orleans, awesome. Um, Dale and I actually uh, had a trip recently and went through there and uh, visited. It was really fun, I loved it. Oh, really hot. Oh man, really hot. <laughs> yep, I think that's a story most places. It's gonna be really hot, but. Luckily, a lot of these plants that we're going to talk about today, too, we can still plant because a lot of them are summer ones. Uh, a lot of them are perennials, too, that you can grow year round. So fall might be a little bit better time to plant some of these. But uh, a lot of these that we're going to be talking about can go and be planted right now, even by seed if you wanted to. Oh, I see someone. Patty is from Torrance, California. I was actually born in Torrance, California. Really small world. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, yes, yeah, so I lived in Torrance for quite a while, actually, um, um, when I was a kid and then moved. Uh, I moved out. I lived in Arizona for a little bit and then now I'm in Oklahoma. So, yeah, small world. I love to see that everybody, we have somebody from like all the corners. I love it. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining. Let's go ahead and hop up the PowerPoint. So we're going to talk about I have a list here of the 10 best flowers to attract pollinators and keep them in your garden too. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about all the different pollinators and keeping them in your garden, all of that. Hey, um, I always pop this slide in because I always forget to mention, we do have a giveaway that we're gonna be doing at the very end of this live stream. It's gonna be for a free one year premium app subscription for our From Seed to Spoon app. So make sure you guys stick around for the end for that, because that will be amazing. And that's going to be, I'm going to be announcing the winner for that at the very end of the webinar. So make sure that you all are commenting and we will get a winner at the end of the webinar. And I will announce that here live. So make sure you guys stay tuned. So first of all, I just wanted to, of course, post a bunch of pretty pictures of pollinators because who doesn't love pretty pictures? Um, and just talk a little bit about the importance. I mean, everybody knows how important having these pollinators are in your garden. Um, and have just having like the honeybees and the butterflies, the hummingbirds, all of that. And there's so many different plant or different insects as well besides these, but these are always the main ones that everybody thinks about whenever they think of the pollinators. Um, so I wanted to, to touch base on these ones since they are the main ones and how to encourage these ones into your garden. Um, and of course, everybody knows too that we honestly would not have a lot of food without them. So it is so important to have them, first of all, in your garden if you are growing food too, but just in general too, to have food for them so they can go and pollinate everywhere and we can have food and because honestly we wouldn't have much of anything without them so it is so important to 
keep them around and do what we can to help support them and make sure that our other plants are thriving and getting pollinated as well. And I did want to touch a little bit on native flowers because they are so important as well. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about like um, the, the specific plants I'm going to be talking about are not necessarily all native flowers for your location. So just looking up what are certain native flowers that do really well in your area will do really good for you. Um, it helps because it, they'll bloom at the right times that you need them in your garden and it'll help to encourage and support those pollinators that you have in your area um, really well. Now, the other plants will do really good too, but it's always really good to have native flowers as well. Um, and it really helps with different uh, pollinators, attracting them in and having uh, other plants healthy. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the fun ones, the flowers to encourage all the pollinators into your gardens. So the first one I wanted to talk about is probably one that everybody is familiar with, um, and that is milkweed. So this is one that you hear a lot about um, around the time of the monarch butterflies, whenever they are going around um, and uh, going through the country. So. The, this milkweed is super important for the monarch butterflies to feed on. It gives them a source of food. They also lay their eggs on it. It is really important to have, especially for those monarch butterflies. And then also they help not just for the monarchs, but also for things like hummingbirds and bees. I mean, as you can see in this picture, the bees love them too. All sorts of pollinators absolutely love milkweed. Um, so this is something that if you are wanting to attract and bring in pollinators and help to protect those monarch butterflies as well, milkweed will be a really good option for you. And so milkweed is one that blooms in the late spring and also at the end of summer. Um, and it'll um, help bring in all these pollinators throughout that time period. And it's really important to know when they bloom too, because it's really great to have a various diversity of when flowers are blooming and when things are blooming to keep your pollinators happy and keeping them coming in at various times and coming for different things. And milkweed is one that is going to need full sun. Um, I tried to go through and find the uh, something for everybody in, in full sun, part shade, and all of that. So we'll talk a little bit about all this. And then next we have Cosmos. I love Cosmos. We love growing them. Um, there's a bunch of different colors of Cosmos. There's the orange and red and yellow and then pink. Of course, they're always my favorite. Um, and then white. Like really, there's all sorts of different colors of Cosmos in different patterns, um, different varieties. They're, they're amazing. Um, and they do really well at attracting and bringing in things like bees and butterflies to your garden. And um, they, will, they will bloom in the early summer, and then they'll continue going throughout your summer until you hit your first frost. So they, none of these flowers will continue really to bloom once you hit your first fall frost. So just keep in mind that a lot of these will bloom sometimes in the, um, in the early spring, summer, and then once they, you get your first fall frost, you're typically done with them. Now, Cosmos are one that they do like full sun, but they can tolerate some shade, um, especially in the afternoon if you're going to give them um, a little bit of break from your afternoon heat, especially if you're in a really hot location um, like some of you guys are, <laughs> like here in me in Oklahoma and um, some, some of y'all where it's really hot down in Louisiana and Florida might might do so, might do good for these cosmos just to get a little bit of shade in the afternoon. <clears throat> and next we have petunias. So petunias are really great. I absolutely love having these in a hanging basket. So as you can see in this picture up here, they are probably one of my very favorite to have in hanging baskets just because of how beautiful they get, how full they get, and they trail over the sides. I constantly see these in 
um, hummingbirds and butterflies. I, I see everything on these flowers. It is absolutely incredible. And so these ones are really great to help bring in, again, a bunch of different colors. And I know everybody's probably familiar with petunias and you know that the, they're constantly blooming. So and continuing to encourage them to bloom if you go through and you deadhead those, those flowers. So as they start to die away, if you just pull them off gently at the stem, it's called deadheading, and you'll pull off those ones and it encourages new growth to come along. So that's one way to go about making the um, making making them continue to come back and continue to bloom throughout. And um, full sun going to be for petunias as well. But again, they can tolerate some part shade. I have found, especially here in Oklahoma, too, that if they get some break from that afternoon heat, that's going to be best for them. Um, petunias can be a little bit sensitive to the heat and the sun. So whenever I say full sun, I'm like, well, yes, full sun, probably up like more in the central northern areas. But for me here, I try to give them a little bit more of some shade, especially in the afternoon. And then, oh, cone flowers. So also known as echinacea. I actually just got several of these. Um, I got several live plants I ordered from Park this year. Uh, so it was one of our Wow Wednesday deals. And I ordered four different echinacea plants. I was so excited for them. I planted them out. And now, as you can see, this top picture up here, that's actually my flower. It was blooming already. I was so excited. It was... Um, it, it was super great and it has already started to bloom and give me several blooms. And this is the first year of it. I'm so excited. Um, it's so beautiful and it will help to bring in lots of bees and butterflies into the garden. I like to go through and interplant these along with my vegetables. So that way I have like a little bit of colors here and there. I have different colors and helps to bring in the pollinators over here. So I'm like, well, while they're over here on the cone flowers, they'll come and Go visit my peppers and my zucchinis as well and pollinate those for me. Uh, so these cone flowers right here will start blooming around midsummer. Um, so around now for me at least. And then it'll continue to go until the first fall frost. Um, and this, these cone flowers are super drought tolerant, so they are perfect to have in your garden if you are one like me that sometimes I forget to go outside and water, <laughs> or if you're in a really hot area, it's really great to, to have around. And of course, I mean, everybody knows echinacea too, um, so it can be so it can be beneficial as well to boost your immune system and things like that. It can be medicinal, so that's exciting as well. So it's, it is just a really good source um, for those bees and butterflies, as well as birds too. Um, and this is one that will survive and come back for you. So this is, this is a perennial one that, I'm, that I have out in my garden. And I'm so excited for this one. I absolutely love it. So, oh, I see a question. How tall does echinacea get? So echinacea, uh, depending on your variety that you have, they can get pretty large. So um, typically like two to four feet. Um, so yeah, if you have small space, this may not be the best one. They do have some dwarf varieties that you can look at too um, that can be shorter, more like one to two feet. So maybe something like that could help you out. Yeah. Small space. So there, there are some plants in here that um, definitely will be better for smaller spaces. But yeah, this this cone flower right here, there are dwarf varieties and smaller ones that you can definitely get. Oh, and she says she can go tall. So yeah, that would be great then. Yeah, this one would probably be great for you. And again, so these cone flowers, they do really well in full sun to part shade. Um, I have mine in full sun and they are thriving right now. Um, so they're, they're doing really great for me. Oh, and then next foxglove. Okay. I am so excited about foxglove. I think it is so beautiful. 
absolutely love them. And they are great at attracting, especially bees and into your garden. So these ones can really help to get in the bees and they are beautiful. I mean, you can see from the pictures right here how pretty they are. They are super tall though. So maybe Yvette, maybe this is a really good option for you as well. If you can go tall, really good vertically, these ones might be a good option for you too, because they are tall, but skinny. So this Fox Club would be a really good option for somebody with smaller space that can grow vertically. Um, and so these Fox Clubs will continue to bloom throughout late spring to early summer. And they will do good again in full sun to part shade. They can tolerate some afternoon shade. So they will be a really good option for those of you who have a small space, want, want something tall. Very nice. Oh, and zinnias. Okay. I know I've probably said this about all of them, but like, I really do love zinnias too. Um, zinnias are probably my very first favorite flower that I had. Um, this was, these were probably the first like real flower that, that we planted out in the garden. And it's probably one of the most common ones as well that everybody has heard of. Um, but zinnias are amazing at attracting in butterflies and bees and hummingbirds, everything you can imagine. Um, they do really well in a lot of different environments. Um, I know in here in our garden, they thrive. They are uh, really good about, my, my, my favorite thing about them is that you can plant them and then at the end of the season, they will drop seeds. And then the next spring, they will just come up and on their own without me having to plant them. I absolutely love it. So we have like this big like wildflower patch where they just reseed themselves every year. And maybe I'll add in a few here and there, but it's amazing. I absolutely love having things like be able to come back on their own too, without me having to replant it too. Um, okay. So is it too late to start flowers in zone 9B? Absolutely not. Yeah. You can definitely still plant, um, pretty much no matter where you are, pretty much everything we've talked about is really good and heat tolerant. Um, so even if it's super hot, just make sure you keep those seeds still moist whenever you plant them out, just keep them moist as they come up and you should be good. Um, I'm still planting here. Um, I know I'm a little bit different zone than you. I'm in zone seven, but still, um, I, I'm still going to be planting out a lot of these seeds. I, I never, I, especially with Xenia, I say it's never too late to throw Xenia. I got a, actually, I got a huge packet of Xenia this year from Parks Wholesale. They have, they have, so Park Seed has a wholesale department too, that they get these huge seed packets of. So I got that for a wildflower garden and to sprinkle everywhere. I'm so excited. Um, but something, even something like that would be perfectly fine to do now. Um, so, oh, go back to Xenia real quick. I didn't finish, but yeah. So Xenia definitely needs to be in full sun. It does really well in the sun and it'll bloom. It'll continue to bloom all the way from spring to again, your first fall frost. So this is one that will keep repeating and um, giving new, new flowers up until your first fall frost. So they will thrive for you all summer long. And they're probably one of my very favorites and so many different varieties that you can choose from. And oh, uh, they're, they're absolutely amazing. I absolutely love them. Okay, so next we have sunflowers. So sunflowers are amazing. Again, I feel like sunflowers are very similar to zinnias in that I can plant them once and I will constantly always have sunflowers in the future. So, cause, because they drop their seeds all the time. If I don't harvest those seeds out to eat, um, like a lot of the times, like the birds will, but even then, like there's gonna be several that fall down and replant themselves. So I, I feel like our garden is constantly filled with sunflowers, which I don't find that a bad thing at all. I think it's amazing because we constantly have like, we have structures too, because we can use the sunflowers as trellises out there and they'll help to support some of our plants 
and we have some that are really tall as well. So they can help to give shade to a lot of the other plants around them too. And also, of course, like we're talking today, bring in pollinators. So they bring in lots of bees and butterflies. So they, they're definitely something that is really good to have in your garden for multiple reasons. Sunflowers are amazing. Um, so they will bloom all the way through summer and early fall. And also, um, of course, sunflower, like their name, they need full sun. Um, I feel like the sunflower can tolerate pretty much any level of sun that you throw at it. Okay, so Patty, I see. Um, are there any that can be grown in pots? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, pretty much anything you can, any of these flowers that we've talked about, you can grow in a pot. Um, but is, if you're asking about sunflowers in particular, definitely. We have, we've actually grown one of those mammoth sunflowers um, before in, one, in a smart pot. And it wasn't a huge smart pot too. It was a um, smaller smart pot. And it was, it was really funny because it was probably like about this big. I don't remember exactly how big it was. Um, uh, maybe, maybe we can find that picture. But um, we have a picture of my husband holding that, the, the smart pot and the huge flower going up. It was amazing. But uh, you would be surprised. The only problem that we had was sometimes it would get blown over um because if it if it didn't have support next to it or if it wasn't around other plants and um <laughs> but otherwise like it thrived it did really well it was probably about 10 feet tall not even exaggerating um and we grew it in probably like a five gallon maybe a five gallon smart pot or so um and if you haven't heard of smart pots they're amazing we grow them we use them all the time in our garden they're just these little fabric raised beds, fabric pots that, uh, oh, they're amazing. Like you simply just buy them, open them up, unfold them, put the soil in and you're good to go. So they're, they're great. And I see smart pots is watching now. Hi, smart pots. <laughs> yep. We love you guys. Okay, so butterfly bush, I had to include butterfly bush. Um, I mean, obviously like this, uh, the, just like the name, <laughs> obviously you can tell it attracts butterflies, um, but you can tell it is super pretty um, and it will attract all sorts of butterflies to your garden and it will constantly be blooming from midsummer to early fall. And um, again, just like most of the other plants that we've talked about, um, I feel like most of these are very similar like the uh they like the full sun or they can tolerate some part shade and i do feel like with a lot of these um with a lot of these plants too the more shade you give them like so they can tolerate it and they'll do okay but they just won't quite bloom as well but they can definitely still live and they will still give you some blooms they just won't quite have like this amount of blooms right here so just keep that in mind as you're going through and planting them and give, putting them in a location. But again, that's one of the great things about putting them in the, in the pots. Like it, so if you put them in, in like a smart pot and move it around, you can move it around and adjust the sun and shade and see what works best for your plant too. We do that a lot with, uh, with ours. We just trial and error what the best location is and move it around, give it a little bit more sun, see if it does better or Let's see, or vice versa. Like if it's in the sun and needs more shade, we move it around. So that's kind of the benefit too, to having container garden. And like I said, like a lot of these plants, you can grow in containers. I mean, pretty much everything we have, we, we put in containers. Uh, bee balm. Okay. I've said this before, but bee balm I do love as well. It is another one of my favorites. I think I just talked about all my favorites today is what I did. I made a list of all my favorite, favorite flowers. Um, but bee balm is absolutely incredible. Um, I actually was out there today. We have a gorgeous bee balm flower that is blooming right now. And there was this beautiful butterfly on it today that I got some video clips of because it was just so pretty. Um, but bee balm is amazing at attracting pretty much everything into our um, into our garden. So just like the name suggests, bee balm, it attracts bees, all of that. 
butterflies, hummingbirds, all of everything pretty much you can think of is attracted to bee balm. And it is super beautiful. As you can tell, it just, it's really unique looking flower. I absolutely love it. And it, it'll thrive for you. Again, mine's blooming right now. It'll start blooming in the late spring time and it'll continue all through summer. So there's, it's super easy to manage to drought tolerant. I don't have to do a lot to keep them around. And I feel like they, they spread and take over and do really well. Um, not quite like mint, um, but still they do really well and they are super great at the full sun. They can tolerate all the sun again that you throw at them. They do really well. And lavender. So lavender, of course, is another one of those um, it, that is super beneficial at attracting your pollinators into the garden, as well as um, bringing in all sorts of uh, bees, butterflies, and as well being edible. I know I saw I saw that there was some chat about different edible flowers too to bring in you uh, the pollinators. So lavender is definitely one that you can um, that you can use um, to uh, you can also eat as well um, and add to teas. Um, so the blooms are definitely variable on what different variety that you get of lavender. So typically it's going to be from the spring through the first fall frost. And then um, again, this is one that's full sun, but may tolerate some, some shade. Now I do see that a few people are talking about how their lavender is struggling. Um, I've definitely had lavender struggle before. And I think um, typically what it is, um, there's a couple different things that can go wrong with lavender. So first of all, um, they do not like having um, their feet wet. Um, so they don't really like to have uh, like be too moist. So you can kill them with too much love. Um, so definitely not giving them a whole bunch of uh, water um, and just keeping them soggy and moist but just giving them lots of water like once every couple days or so, like whenever, whenever they get dry. So let them fully dry out before you water them again. Um, something else too, I definitely think that they can be um, finicky about the sun as well. Like, like a few of the others, they might do a lot better for you if you're in a hot place by getting some afternoon sun. Um, they would definitely thrive a lot better if you're super hot to get some, a little bit of shade in the afternoon. Yeah. So what is a good uh, edible pollinator? So we've uh, talked a little bit. I know I mentioned a couple of them. I hope I, I hope I said it whenever I went through. So I know like lavender you could like technically eat and also bee balm you could put in like teas and stuff like that. But there's also things like nasturtiums and marigolds even too. Um, calendula, um, borage, um, I, oh, and I, I mentioned sunflowers as well. Um, the sunflower seeds, obviously you can eat sunflower seeds. Um, so a lot of these, um, even things like, uh, squash blossoms. So, um, your plants, like you can pull off like the male plants after they've been pollinated. Hopefully, of course, uh, you want to take the, hopefully your pollinators have already worked and then you take some squash blossoms and you can actually eat those too, which is awesome. So just a few tips to encourage these pollinators to stay. So after you gave them their food source and all of that, um, you want to make sure that you give them a little bit of variety. So planting different colors and different types of things will help to bring in different types of, of creature, creatures into your garden and all sorts of variety. And that's what you want. Um, so again, different colors and you want to pay attention to when they bloom. So you want things that are like early bloomers as well as things that are late bloomers too. So you'll want to make sure that you're, you have blooms that are staying all the way till the first fall frost and some of them that are coming out right away too. So that way you can feed them all season long and they don't ever have to leave. So it's perfect. A um, few other things, just trying to make sure to avoid pesticide use 
because um, a lot of the times if you kill all of the bad bugs, um, then you're going to not have, um, I mean, you won't have a lot of food for like things like ladybugs even and stuff like that. So just, a, and sometimes some of these pesticides can hurt the beneficial creatures as well. So um, we keep pesticide use down to a minimum. I mean, try not to use any at all um, and try not to hurt any of these pollinators. So um, also having water sources. So having like bird baths or like a little shallow dish of water or um, and anything like that, just having some source of water for them to drink from will help to encourage them to stay because then they don't have to go elsewhere to get water whenever they're done eating. So try to make sure that they have everything they need right there in your garden. And then of course, some shelter and protection, um, things like this, um, like this little bee house. Um, you can make your own too, or you can buy some as well. Um, just having some areas for them to have shelter, be protected and hide and um, can really help to give them somewhere to go. So again, keeping them in your area and giving them everything that they need to survive will be the best way to keep them in your garden and keep them working for you and pollinating all your other plants. <laughs> Okay, are there specific colors that different pollinators are drawn to? Okay, so yes, I mean, I don't know how scientific it is, but so sometimes like there are different um, colors that they are known to like. Um, so like butterflies are typically like the, the uh, brighter colors. So things like the bright red and pink and purple, yellow, things like that. Um, for the butterflies. Um, again, same with hummingbirds. So they like the really bright colors, um, things like that. Um, and then the bees, again, like they'll like, um, they'll like some of that too, but also things like the white and yellow um, plants as well too. Um, but again, I don't know how scientifically based that is, but um, that that is how it's known to be like bright, bold colors. Um, the the hummingbirds and butterflies do love. Do marigolds attract pollinators? So yeah, absolutely. Um, um, they will help to bring in all sorts of different pollinators into your garden. I see them on my, um, I have these huge whopper marigolds growing that I see pollinators on them all the time and they're growing amazing. Um, but yet, yeah, absolutely. Um, marigolds will definitely be an option as well. Um, French marigolds especially work really well for pollinators too. <laughs> okay, so Kate wants to know, are there any vegetables that would be specifically beneficial to plant zinnias next to? Um, well, I mean, pretty much anything for zinnias would be really good. So I would say any ones that would attract more of your like predator insects that you need your predator insects for. So if you have issues with like the cucumber beetles or aphids or things like that. Um, so, I mean, I say that, so like cucumbers would do really well, tomatoes, peppers, beans, lettuce, um, those type of vegetables would be really good too. Um, so pretty much anything, um, would do really well, um, like to bring in any, any sort of those insects. Um, we've actually had a zinnia that had a praying mantis that was living like on the, on the zinnia plant. Um, and it was just like, <laughs> yeah, it, it was pretty crazy to see this huge praying mantis on there. Um, but unfortunately some, sometimes praying mantis can get good, good insects too, but, um, sometimes, sometimes luckily they, uh, they get mostly the bad ones, but we have seen them get good ones too, unfortunately. But I do love seeing the praying mantis around because they can do a lot of really good things too. So, and I know they specifically love zinnias. 
Okay, can echinacea and foxglove be grown close together? My daughter wants flowers in the front of her window. These would be great because they're near my food garden. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think they'd be great, especially like the, because the foxglove grows like so small and vertical. Um, I'm not small. They're really tall, but like, I'm talking like slender. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that these would do fantastic together and it would be really good to have next to your food garden because you would bring in pollinators as well as uh, being pretty. So I think it's perfect. Ha, I love it. No space to walk. <laughs> I know I, that's, that's my problem too. I feel like I, every time I'm out in the garden, I have to like go around my plants because I get volunteer plants all the time. My, uh, especially things like, you know, like the zinnias that replant themselves and the bee balm that replants itself. Like I have so many things just like growing voluntarily out there now. And I, I sometimes have a hard time walking around too. So I know how you feel, but I feel like that's a great problem to have, right? <laughs> Uh, so Kate wants to know at what point should you harvest lavender to dry while still giving the pollinators as much access as possible? So that's that's a fantastic question. So what I typically do is just pull a little bit at a time throughout the year. So that way I'm not making it so that way I don't have any there before. Or if I have multiple plants, like I'll pull from one plant and then I'll pull from another plant later on. Um, just take little bits at a time is how I do. I don't typically get all of it at once. Um, just because again, I like the looks of it too. And I want the pollinators to have some too. So I like to share. Um, but I feel like having a little bit at a time is kind of the way to go. And I have multiple plants. So that way I can just pull from one plant. And then the next time I want to go, I pull from the other. Yeah, Mexican sunflower. We actually, we actually have some of those too in our garden that grow wild. So beautiful. Absolutely. I find that too as well. The hummingbirds love them. Um, I mean, and the bees, we constantly have bees all over as well. Oh, uh, Jamie can't seem to keep lavender alive. Oh no. Well, I mean, it's probably... Um, I mean, it's part of the problem, things that we talked about earlier about how lavender can be difficult um, is if you're giving it too much love, so too much water. Um, that is a common thing that I see, and it's because we love our plants so much. Um, but yeah, that is something that we see a lot of if you want to just make sure that your lavender um, dries out and then give it water after it dries out. Um, just make sure that it's not staying wet. That's probably the issue. Um, if not, I would look at sun um, because it can be finicky of not getting enough sun or getting too much sun as well. So um, you might want to look at that and see um, if you can adjust the sun at all. Like if it's in a pot, great. I would practice like see how it does in more sun or less sun and see, see how you can get it working. <clears throat> so Linda says she's had a real problem with caterpillars and had to use BT to get rid of them. That's perfectly fine. I know I have those issues as well sometimes, especially with like the, um, like the cabbage worms and sometimes the tomato hornworm as well. Um, but BT is organic. Um, so it, it won't hurt like your other beneficials, but it will hurt the caterpillars. So anything that is a caterpillar um, will die from the BT, um, but it won't harm any of the other beneficials, luckily. And this is one that is all organic. So we've used BT in the past before as well. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Pretty much everything is going to be any, any sort of blooms and bright colors, vivids, anything like that is going to be fantastic to attract pollinators. And um, yeah, so those ones will be absolutely amazing in your garden and help to bring in pollinators. So these ones that I mentioned today are just known as like really, really amazing ones. And I could have honestly talked for probably like hours and talked about like 100 different flowers 
and plants that could help bring in beneficials. Um, but obviously we don't have that amount of time, but um, yes, these are definitely ones that will be really good for you to bring in pollinators as well. Okay, <laughs> so um, I do want to mention too that if we um, didn't get a chance to answer any of your questions that you have, or if you have any other questions like absolute or um, after the fact, um, come into our From Seed to Spoon app and check out Growbot because Growbot can go in there and answer some of your questions that you may have. Um, he, that Growbot can is like an AI chatbot that can help answer any sort of gardening questions. So it's super helpful. And thank you so much, Melissa. I'm so glad that you love the Seed to Spoon app. I'm so glad you find it helpful. <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad that you guys are enjoying it and found it helpful and sharing with your friends. Um, I do want to announce our giveaway too today. Um, so we have a winner today for our giveaway. Um, it's going to be for a one-year free app, premium app subscription. So you can have all of the premium features unlocked for a full year, which is really exciting. Okay, and the lucky winner is Jacob Anderson. Congratulations, Jacob. And so all you need to do is email us at info at seedtospoon.net. It's down there right there at the bottom. And we will get you set up for your one-year app subscription. Yay. So don't worry if you guys um, didn't win and you really want to. We do this every few weeks. We come in and um, do a webinar over different topics, things that are applicable to our garden right now and all of that. Um, I think the next one we're talking about heat plants, maybe. I don't even remember. I look, I look at it right after this webinar. So, but we'll, we'll be here again soon doing another webinar going live on our YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed already, make sure that you do now. So that way you can come in and follow us and see when our next live stream will be. And if you guys aren't already following us, make sure you do. We have shorts going out on YouTube all the time, as well as like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook all the time. We're on there posting little short videos um, I'm on there every day posting something about um, from our garden about what we're doing and all of that. Um, so make sure you guys are following us and subscribe to our channels if you haven't already. So um, I do see that there's a few more questions that are popping up. So we'll answer a few more questions as we um, as we wrap it up. Okay, so Bonnie wants to know how you encourage ladybugs to stay. So ladybugs are one um again you want to make sure that you have a shallow water area for your ladybugs um and so if you're talking about like releasing your own ladybugs which is something that we've done before we've actually purchased ladybugs um not where we're at right now but at our last garden we did um and so if you're going to be releasing them i would release them in like the evening time Make sure you have plenty of food for them to eat. And by food, I mean things like aphids. So I wouldn't go through and kill all of your aphids or spray or do anything like that. You wanna make sure that they have a good source of food because if they have a good source of food, they're gonna stick around and work for you. Um, and again, having water right there for them as well is going to encourage them to stay. So pretty much I never have any aphid issues because I just leave them be and I let the ladybugs work which is amazing. I love to have that problem. <laughs> okay. What can I keep, what can I do to keep aphids from getting started in the first place? Does anything repel them? Well, again, I am going to try and argue the the benefits of ladybugs here again, because ladybugs will do all the work for you and you won't have to do anything really. Um, like, like I said, like I don't do anything for ladybugs or for uh, aphids anymore. Um, but there's some simple things that you can do just like by spraying the undersides of the leaves where the aphids are hanging out. Um, and they're super small and tiny. So if you just spray them off with hose, they can't get back up there and they'll just die. Um, so, um, 
repelling them. I know there's, a, I mean, really the, the biggest thing that I would do is just look at attracting ladybugs into your garden. Um, and that's going to be the best way to um, go about repelling them is by attracting ladybugs and having ladybugs there too. Um, and I did have a webinar uh, two weeks ago. I think it was on my one from two weeks ago. Um, that it, it's here on YouTube too, so you can search it up. And it was all on pest management. So I talked a lot about aphids as well on that one. So that might be beneficial for you to check out as well. Okay, I want my pollinators to get into my new raised beds, but I have to keep a netting up right now to protect from our squirrels and chipmunks. Oh man, yeah, that is definitely challenging. I uh, I feel you. <laughs> um, again, I do want to mention the uh, webinar that I had a few weeks ago because I did talk about squirrels. Um, honestly, I would try and just manage those squirrels and chipmunks and see what you can do to manage them first and then take the netting down. So that way, um, that way you can get some beneficials in there and pollinators and you don't have to pollinate by hand. Um, I will say one of the biggest things that we found for squirrels or any sort of like small creatures like that, um, the motion activated sprinkler, it works really well. Um, sometimes a little too well because I forget that it's on and it gets me. Um, but still it works really well. So if you have like one specific area right here that you're working to protect, I'd put up a set up a motion activated sprinkler and have it set to go off, um, for any sort of motion. So that way, if one of the squirrels or chipmunks comes up that then it'll get like a burst of water at it and it'll scare them away. Um, so this is, this might be something that you look into doing. So that way you can take that netting off and get some of these pollinators in there. Okay, how do I get rid of horseradish or at least contain it once it's already established and taking over my garden? Oh man, so we're having issues. So horseradish is one, um, I mean, I would have to, I would say you're gonna need to dig out all, all the roots because um, you're gonna have like the, the roots down on the bottom, um, those pieces. So you wanna make sure that you take all those out. Um, and also what I would do if you, think that there might be some left behind is try and smother it out as well. So try and get out as much as you can, as much as a pain in the butt as that might be, but try and get as much of the roots out as you can. And then try and smother them either with like the black plastic or things like cardboard, wood chips, things like that. Um, and you put that on top of it and it'll help to kill all the weeds or your unwanted plants, all of that. So Hopefully that helps get rid of your horseradish problem. <laughs> okay, how can I get rid of ants in my grow bags? So um, ants, I mean, sometimes can be beneficial, but I know they're definitely not optimal. I mean, especially they're fire ants, though we definitely don't want that. Um, but they definitely don't really want them around where your food is because they have been known to farm aphids and things like that. Um, what I would do is just sprinkle like some diatomaceous earth around, um, just on the base, um, in the soil, because you don't want to get it on the leaves or any sort of the uh, plants or anything like that, like the top parts, because it can harm other, other creatures as well. So you want to make sure that you just get it where you have that ant problem. Um, there's also a lot of different ant traps and like things that you can make as well, things like with bor borax and sugar, um, things like that. So again, check out that past webinar that I had from a couple weeks ago. And um, also like just our app too has a critter section that you can go in and just go to the critters tab and you can pull up all sorts of different critters and it'll give you tips for organically handling any of these in your garden. So it'll give you a bunch of tips in there as well. Okay, Emma sees two different kinds of ladybugs. So she sees the small red ones and larger orange ones. Are they both beneficial? So um, 
I definitely, like, I see this a lot, too, about the Asian ladybugs. Um, they can be beneficial as well, but they are more aggressive. Um, and they can also invade your inside areas in the winter time. So it's not really something that you want to try and encourage, like the regular ladybugs um, that we have here. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of like a, I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, but I always try to encourage the smaller ones uh, and then try and not encourage the other ones if you can. <laughs> okay, well, I think that that was the majority of the questions, I hope. And like I said, if I miss anybody's questions, I'm sorry. Um, we have Growbot right there and I'll go back in to after the fact and you guys can feel free to continue to comment um, and I will come back in and reply when I get the chance and uh, I'll continue to make shorts as well about a lot of these topics that you guys have questions on. Um, so make sure that you follow along on our YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, wherever you guys are. Um, we're on most of those places. Um, so make sure that you follow us. And again, I will be back going live again for our next webinar um, in July. So make sure that you uh, stay tuned for that one and I will continue to post about it. <laughs> See y'all later. Thank you so much for joining.